Uh, my name is Peter Burns. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the ARC in the United States. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the ARC, we are a nationwide charity federation um, that advocates with and on behalf of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and um, as our mission as an organization is to promote and protect the civil rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and support their being included in their communities um, throughout their lifetimes. Um, we are um, a 70, 70 year old organization, almost 70 year old organization that was founded by um, parents at, at a time in the history in the United States where parents were typically advised that they should institutionalize their children and these parents um, refused to do that and went on to create um, the largest civil rights and disability services organization um, in the U.S. Um, very happy today to have the chance to moderate this session and talk about accessible elections. Um, I hope some of you also attended the session earlier today that talked about um, the um, accessibility of voting to pe people with cognitive disabilities. I think the two sessions together um, really work very, very well. Um, obviously, obviously, elections are really important. Um, and voting is really important um, because um, the lives of people with, with disabilities, whether they're intellectual and developmental disabilities or physical or sensory disabilities, are very much impacted by the, the decisions that policymakers make. Um, and so the rights of people um, are determined in, by state legislatures. Implementation of those rights, of course, are determined um, often by other elected officials. Um, and uh, so this is really critical, critically important. We've got a great panel for you um, today. Um, you're going to um, hear um, from about developments in, in a number of different, uh, different countries. Um, and, and let's see if I can just um, briefly um, introduce our panelists. We have to your left, my far right, um, Antonio, and I apologize in advance for, for messing up anybody's names. Uh, my, my far right, your left, Antonio Martinez Pujale Lopez from Universidad Miguel Hernandez de Elche. Um, and then next to um, Antonio, we have um, Virginia Atkinson from the International F uh, Foundation for Electoral Systems. And then we have uh, nice. Lorenzo, I got this all messed up, sorry. Lorenzo Cordova from INE, the National Electoral Institute. And then um, to my left, we have uh, Michael Boda from Election Saskatchewan. And then uh, Fernando, Fernando Pe Pe Pessoa de Salve Salvera Mello from the Superior electoral um, court in Brazil. And um, on a, my f uh, far left, uh, Revital, your right, Revital Schertz-Swirsky from Access um, Israel. So welcome to all our panelists and to all of you participating in the um, session today. Um, so we're gonna start with um, Virginia. Good afternoon. Um, so thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm Virginia Atkinson from IFIS, the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. We're an international nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., and we work on issues related to democracy and governance in countries all around the world. Um, so I have a PowerPoint here. How do I work that? Thank you. Aha. Okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna be talking today about our election access observation toolkit, which is um, guidance for people with disabilities on how to be election observers. So IFAS uh, works in partnership with disabled persons organizations in countries all around the world. Virginia, and Virginia, I forgot to do some, one thing. Uh, we did wanna ask if anybody needs a sign language or interpreter, um, if you can raise your hand so we know whether there's a need for a sign language interpreter. No, it looks like no one here. Okay. 
Yes. yes. <laughs> no. So DPOs were telling us that international and national observer groups were not recruiting people with disabilities to serve as observers. And in particular, women with disabilities were underrepresented as election observers. Uh, we were also hearing from our DPO partners that election observer groups were not including questions related to accessibility on their checklists. Um, and if they were, there were just maybe a couple basic questions related to physical accessibility, rather than looking at the entire process for people with all different types of disabilities. Um, so for example, um, last year in Armenia, I will not name them, but there was a big well-known international observer group that was there. In their observer report, they said that 70% of the polling stations were physically accessible. So I was there. I did not see any polling stations that were physically accessible. Um, so I consulted with our DPO partner, asked them, you know, what was their take on how accessible the polling stations were, and their estimate was it was closer to 7% of polling stations were physically accessible. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the International Observer Group and asked them, you know, where were these polling stations? I, I did not see any. Our DPO partner also agrees that the, the physical accessibility was very low and asked them what their criteria was for determining accessibility of the polling stations. And this International Observer Group said that their criteria was if the polling station had three stairs or less, then that counted as accessible. Yeah, so I can see a lot of your faces in here. Now we're a group with allies, we all understand three steps does not equal accessible. Um, so there was a big issue here with understanding what accessibility means um, that was becoming an even larger problem for local disabled persons organizations. Um, so imagine Armenia, DPOs there had been telling the government that you know, basically none of the polling stations were physically accessible. And then an international observer group comes in and in their official observer report mm -hmm. says 70% of the polling stations are accessible. So imagine how disempowering that is for local advocates. Um, so to try and help mitigate some of these barriers that our uh, DPO partners were telling us about, we developed a sort of a parallel election observation that can be conducted focused entirely on election access and inclusion for people with disabilities. And we've been training people with disabilities to be election observers and go out on election day. So, so far we have worked um, in over 30 elections with this tool in 13 different countries. Here we go. Um, so in the toolkit, there's an overview of international standards, such as the CRPD, Article 29, Article 12. Uh, we also provide sample questions that can be adapted to each country context, both for short-term observations, so those that are just pretty much conducted around the election day, as well as for long-term observations, so ones that look at, for example, events ahead of time like debates. And the toolkit also gives guidance for contextualizing those questions to local laws and policies. <laughs> So for example, in Indonesia, uh, voters with disabilities are allowed an assistant if they would like one, but that assistant has to sign a form that says that they will maintain the secrecy of the person's vote and they will vote the way that the person asked them to. So in Indonesia, our election access observers look specifically to make sure that poll workers are offering this form and that assistants are signing them. But that's something that's Indonesia specific, so that's not in our general checklist. But this toolkit gives guidance to local uh, disabled persons organizations on how to look at their laws and policies and add these related questions based on their context. So here are some, some of the sample questions that are there. Uh, one of them is, is the legal framework free from barriers that could exclude persons with disabilities, such as requirements to speak the native language of the country, and are there legal capacity restrictions? So the reason we ask about these two questions is the native language one might not seem immediately obvious uh, why that's related, but in many countries, sign language doesn't count as the native language of the country. So if you're a sign language user and that's you know, your native language, you don't speak, quote unquote, the native language of the country, so in some cases you wouldn't be eligible to run for office. So that's something that we specifically want to look at in these election access observations. Similarly, legal capacity restrictions, um, a majority of countries around the world actually have laws that are directly or indirectly excluding people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities from voting. One of the other types of questions we ask is about how many voters received assistance in marking their ballot, and we specifically ask our observers to disaggregate that by gender. Uh, we have found that um, more women than men are, are quote unquote offered assistance in marking their ballots. So this is something that we also want to track and keep a record of in the observations. So part of the training that we do with observers is we show a series of photos. 
Um, so this photo here is, is one example that we show when we ask, you know, is this accessible? What does everyone think? Yes, no? The photo shows a man uh, using crutches, putting his ballot in a ballot box that's placed on the ground. So this is, this is a good example. You know, there's no steps, the ground is flat, the ballot box is on the ground, so he doesn't have to reach up into some inaccessible location to put the box in. Here's another one. Any guesses here? Accessible, yes, no? <laughs> Pretty inaccessible, I think, for voters with and without disabilities. Um, this is an easy one. What about this photo? This one's a little bit more challenging. Uh, no, it's a <laughs> so this one, this one confuses our observers because there's the international accessibility sign on a ramp. So they think, okay, well there's a ramp, it has the international accessibility symbol. The answer should be yes, but you know, this is a very steep ramp <laughs> that a wheelchair user couldn't navigate either up or down by themselves. So this is not a, a good example. Um, then lastly, here we go. Accessible, yes, no. This shows a woman voting on a car hood. <laughs> so in this photo, the, the poll workers have brought the ballot out uh, to, the, to the parking lot, which was helpful so that the woman didn't have to go all the way inside. Um, but there's, what, five people standing around watching how she's marking her ballot. Um, so there's, there's not any secrecy of the vote here. Some of the challenges that we've had are, I think, probably what you would assume would be the obvious challenges of in encouraging national and international observer groups to look at access issues and to include people with disabilities as observers. Um, and then also something that maybe would be less expected is um, people with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by election violence. So either directly because of election violence or indirectly just the threat of election violence. Um, for example, I trained an observer in the Dominican Republic who was deaf. Um, she got her badge, was fully accredited, and on election day her family wouldn't let her go out to vote because they said, um, you know, if there's gunshots, you won't hear them. So because we want to protect you, we won't let you go out and vote. So this issue of people with disabilities either directly or indirectly experiencing election violence is also a problem in terms of their political engagement. For this tool, um, we were asked to talk about innovation and impact. So one of the things I think that's um, most important here is that it supports DPOs in developing evidence-based policies. So they're able to go to government and say, we observed this many polling stations and we saw this trend in this many different locations. And it really helps convince election management bodies that there are issues. In terms of financing and sustainability, um, the, the pilots and the observations that we've conducted so far have been funded by Australia, Canada, and the US. And then many governments have actually made accommodations to their electoral process based on the findings, and those were funded by those governments themselves. And next steps, we've got the, the toolkit translated into several different languages. Myanmar is the most recent one that was just published. Um, and upcoming, we'll be conducting another observation in Guatemala in July. And so we are hoping um, that using these, this election access observation toolkit, we can continue to support evidence-based recommendations to election management bodies to be accessible. I'm told my time is over, so I will leave it there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Virginia. So, that, <laughs> so, so now that we've heard about a great tool that's been used in 13 countries to try to ass, um, assess the ex accessibility of election sites, uh, we're going, going to go on to hear about efforts that have been made in three different countries to actually address bar barriers um, in those countries. And so um, I'd like to for, ask Fernando if he would uh, go next. Sure. Do you need a clicker? Clicker for the... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon for all of you here present today. My name is Fernando Mello, and I'm a federal judge in Brazil. And before I start this presentation of the Voters Accessibility Program of the Brazilian Superior Electoral Court, I want to express my honor while being here on behalf of Chief Justice Rosa Weber of Brazilian Supreme Court and the head of the Superior Electoral Court, as well as in this occasion, register our pleasure, gratitude, and happiness of seeing our program being chosen by the Assessment Committee of Project Zero.
Firstly, I clarify that elections in Brazil are the responsibility of the ju judiciary branch of government, whose duty is attributed to the Superior Electoral Court, made up of seven justices, three from the Supreme Court, two from the Superior Court of Justice, and two lawyers, to regional electoral courts and electoral judges throughout the entire country. Therefore, this program presented today is the result of administrative activities of the Brazilian judiciary power approved by the, for the Superior Electoral Court's plenary. It's important to highlight that the voters' accessibility program in Brazil is composed of an effective, innovative nature since it consolidates many accessibility measures by means of a single legal provision and comprises more than the physical accessibility in the overcoming of physical barriers. It aims to eliminate any difficulty that may prevent or reduce the effective participation of people with mental, intellectual, sensorial, physical disability, may be permanent or temporary in the society and in Brazilian democracy. In this contest, the Brazilian electoral program of accessibility is characterized by its permanency, or in other words, by being aimed at a gradual implementation of measures for the removal of any barrier in order to give people wider and unrestrained access to the electoral, to electoral process. Brazil is a country of continental dimensions with appro approximately 8,516,000 square kilometers of territory extension and a population of 210 million people, which is the reason why the barriers and the difficulties faced by disabled people in Brazil are different dep depending on the region and on the local circumstances. Bearing that in mind, the electoral accessibility program determines that the regional courts, one for each severed, uh, federate state, and the electoral judges shall develop an action plan aimed at informing voting places of easy access, granting disabled voters access to closer parking spaces, providing electronic voting machines placed at suitable height, and doors with appropriate length and also establishing partnerships and agreements for monitoring the accessibility measures. The Brazilian voting system is electronic, which means that voters vote via electronic voting machines that must be equipped with keyboard in braille code and enabled with audio systems or earphones for getting along with the voting, obviously according to the voter, voters' special needs. We have in Brazil today 479,516 polling stations nationwide. There is also a provision determining that prior, prioritize existence to people with disabilities, pregnant and breastfeeding women, and people aged over 60, as well as the encouragement for people who are able to communicate in sign language to work at the elections. The Brazilian Electoral Court's websites were adapted not only for obtaining general information, but also for accompanying judicial procedures in order to grant people with visual disabilities the full access to any information. Also, the electoral law is available by audio tracks. All texts from every electoral justice website are interpreted in Brazilian sign language or converted to a voice version in Brazilian Portuguese. As most people might know, in Brazil, elections take place every two years. Therefore, the Legal Provision Institute determines that in non-electoral years, awareness campaigns on the importance of voting and of keeping the personal data updated should be carried out for voters with disabilities so that the electoral justice can comply with the accessibility rules accessibility rules. In an electoral year, there should also be awareness campaigns about the importance of democratic participation, informing that the person with disability will have up to 151 days prior to the elections to require the implementation of the accessibility rules that are applicable to their case. 
to notify the electoral judge about their restrictions and needs so that the voting process can be eased, and to elect a person of trust count on, to count on during voting if needed. In order to monitor and inspect all these measures, a commission was created in the, super, in the Superior Electoral Court, and it is in, large, in charge of promoting equality as a well-being state for all, reducing inequalities, and assisting the enforcement of fundamental principles and guarantees. It should be noted that the electoral, the electoral courts must submit a report to the Superior Electoral Court by December 20th every year on compliance. Diminishing barriers, may they be architectonical, communication, or behavioral, is the key to the to total inclusion of people with disabilities. Through the initiatives described, the Superior Electoral Court has been involving day by day in the search of equal treatment for all. In the past elections of 2018, more than 940,000 voters with disabilities were able to exercise their right to vote. And this number has been increasing as elections goes by. It was 605,000 voters in 2016 and 436,000 voters in 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, if a world without barriers is our life's goal, a democracy without barriers, that is, a real and a strong democracy demands effective participation of all. The will of the majority can only be called majority if the participation is broad, open to all, regardless of ideologies, preference, and political trends. That is true democracy. Nothing about us without us, nothing for us without us. Those are just a few measures that seek the inclusion of persons with disabilities in Brazilian democracy. In 2019, we work to continue, our work continues, Um, our work continues so that the court services are widely available to all people without distinction. The improvement should be permanent and continuous. We acknowledge there is still too much to advance. This fact, however, should not obscure the progress that has already been achieved and is in per permanent transformation. That's our destiny, a legacy that honors all of us who make inclusion our life's ideal. This is not for me or for you, for Brazilian or Austrians. This is for humankind. Thank you very much. So next we're going to hear from Canada, from Michael Boda. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Peter. Um, I serve as the Chief Electoral Officer for the Canadian province of Saskatchewan. And I'm here today to talk about our accessibility implementation plan and how we've worked with our jurisdiction to improve the services we offer to voters uh, with disability as well as uh, voters who may require special assistance, such as our, our seniors. Before moving to the details of our plan, uh, I'll briefly introduce you to Election Saskatchewan. Uh, we are an independent, impartial election management body that administers provincial level elections in Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, it's a province that's located in the center of Canada. Uh, it has a land size of eight times the size of Austria, three times the size of the United Kingdom, and it's a little bigger than France but it only has 1.1 million people living there. So, you can talk as loud as you want, and no one is gonna complain. <laughs> the story of the development of our plan began in 2012, a year after the province's general election, which was held in November of 2011. A review written in 2012 by our National Election Management Body, Elections Canada, found that Saskatchewan lacked measures to address the needs of voters with disabilities. It said we did not provide enough accessible options for voters, our voter education and information distribution methods were poor, and some of our election day workers showed a lack of sensitivity to voters who required extra assistance in casting a ballot. <laughs> 
After the release of that report, I was asked to lead Election Saskatchewan, and the results of the outside assessment were very concerning to me. So in my role as Chief Electoral Officer, one of my key priorities uh, was trying to understand the problem. Now, was the issue resources? Was it a lack of training? Was it legislation that was too restrictive? Or was it some combination of all of that? To determine what was not working, Election Saskatchewan partnered with two outside organizations. Now, one was IFAS, the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, an NGO that works to improve election administration worldwide, and we have Virginia with us here today, who has, I've worked with a lot over the years. The second was um, called the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy. It's a well-respected school of public policy in Canada and within our jurisdiction. Our goal was to improve the voting experience for people with disabilities as well as for older people. To gather data, both qualitative and quantitative, we invited more than 200 disability and senior groups from across our province to share their concerns with us. Their input would be integral to forming our, the development of our, our project plan. The plan that we came up with was designed to address four problematic areas and expand on these in the next, I'll expand on these in the next few slides. First, we needed to do a better job of offering voting options to the citizens of our province. Second, we needed to look at physical polling place accessibility. Third, we needed to look at the, product and, the products and services that we were offering. And finally, we needed to improve voter information and voter education tools. So, what did our solution look like? Our plan addressed all four of these problems in a variety of, of ways. Increased voter options. On the issue of voting options, we ultimately made two primary changes. One was the introduction of what we'll call, we call homebound voting, where a voter with a disability applies to have election workers come to their home as opposed to traveling to a polling location. And I'm going to offer a few more details on, a, on another slide on that. Another big change related to allowances to vote before Election Day, during what we call advance voting. For the first time, advance voting was opened up to all voters. Previously, a voter needed to, a defined reason to vote in advance, and accessibility wasn't one of those reasons. This change introduced another 35 hours of voting spread over five days. Improving the physical accessibility of our polling locations was a key priority for us as well. We created a standardized list of accessibility criteria and then each of our more than 1,000 polling locations was compared against that list. If a polling place didn't meet the accessibility requirements, we mitigated the issue by adding ramps, by creating extra parking spaces for voters, by using extra mats in entrances, and a variety of other fixes. At every polling location in the province, we had a worker called an information officer who would assist any voter who needed extra help. Throughout the day, our information officers checked the accessibility fixes we put in place and ensured they were working correctly, and also checked to see if new issues had developed, and if there was something, it was to be corrected as soon as possible. We also worked very hard to improve not only the accessibility aids we had at polling locations, but also the service we offered to our stakeholders. In my role, I've worked very hard to reinvent what it means to serve our stakeholders. Service has become one of our core values at Election Saskatchewan and remains at the forefront of everything that we do. So with this in mind, each of our more than 12,000 election workers received sensitivity training through a video and our manuals included information on how to assist a voter with disabilities in a respectful manner. We also improved on the types of assistive tools we had at polls. We had lamps that could be clipped to voting screens, bail ballot, uh, braille ballot templates, pencil grips, improved signage, among other things. And then finally, we worked to improve our communication and our outreach. And in Saskatchewan, actually across the country in Canada, we produce what are called voter information cards, or the VIC. Uh, 
The VIC is a, custom, is a customized card that's sent out to every registered voter, which tells them the where, when, what uh, of what we need to do in order to vote. This past election, for the first time, we included information on polling place accessibility. If a location was accessible, it was marked as such. We also produced election materials in alternate formats, audio, larger text, and we worked to ensure our website met current accessibility standards. I would offer more details on homebound voting. Homebound voting was introduced following a legislative recommendation that, that my office made, and it allowed any voter who was unable to vote in person due to a disability, as well as any other who, uh, person who's caring for that individual, to cast their ballot without leaving their home. The voter needed to apply to their local returning office, swear an oath, and then they met the legislative, uh, that they met the legislative criteria, and then during the advanced voting period, a team of election officials went to their home, bringing all the necessary materials, included, including a sealed ballot box, and administered the vote for that person. As more people become aware of the option to vote at home, I believe we will see increased interest um, as it allows voters with disabilities to cast their ballot in a secure, and a secure environment. So, what about this plan was innovative? First, many components had never been tried within the province of Saskatchewan. Our approach, second, our approach was one of a few examples in Canada and actually in North America where an election management broad, body brought in outside organizations to assist with the development of a plan and then with the evaluation of that plan after the event. A critical outside perspective is so important. When you run elections, you typically only get to do it every few years. Our internal focus needs to be on administering the event, but by bringing in these outside experts, we're allowed to focus on the core work of delivering an election in real time and still acquire valuable data after the fact. A third innovation, just as important, is that we listen carefully to what our voters said they needed before we established a plan. By collaborating with IFAS and Johnson Shoyama, we were able to listen and then establish an operational plan for addressing the concerns they raise. And then we were very careful to have our experts come back to evaluate how we had done. With that, my time is up, so I'll yield back to the chair. Okay. Um, thank you, Michael. We're going to move next to Lorenzo. Uh, clicker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I am uh, Lorenzo Cordova. I'm the president of the National Electoral, Electoral Institute of Mexico, which is the INE, which is the independent and autonomous uh, public agency responsible for the organization of the federal and uh, the co-organization of the local elections and uh, an, an institution which is empowered to establish the general criteria and regulation under which elections should be run in Mexico. Our regulation are, by the way, compulsory both in the federal and in the local level. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to Zero Project for the invitation to participate in this panel and in this enlightening 2019 conference, and of course, for choosing a reward our inclusion and accessible election project as we, uh, that we implemented in last year, uh, year's election. I would like to uh, start with a premise. In uh, 2018, uh, Mexico held the largest and the most complex election ever. It was the most complex because of the context of large insecurity and criminal violence in the country, deep social inequality, and intense political confrontation. It was the largest because of the number of potential voters, almost 90 million people, the inedited number of polling stations to be installed, more than 156,000 uh, polling stations, and consequently, the uh, polling station officers required more than a million people, as well as the unprecedented number of elected public uh, posts under dispute, more than 18,000 in the federal, local, and municipal level. <clears throat> 
but it was also the most inclusive election ever made in our country. It was the most inclusive in many, in many ways. On one hand, thanks that the parity principle was included in the Constitution in 2014, and there were many gender affirmative actions settled by the electoral authority, now we have in Mexico a 50-50% parliament in both higher and lower chambers that allocate my country's legislative assembly as the third one with the largest number of women MPs around the world. And for the first time, thanks to the decision adopted by the National Electoral Institute, we introduced an indigenous quota and therefore now have indigenous representatives in the parliament. On the other hand, we reinforced former inclusion mechanisms and introduced new ones to improve people with any disability electoral participation. I would like to enlist some of these actions. First, we issued a protocol to allow for the first time the participation of people with disabilities as polling station officers that suppose that no matter what kind of disability you have, you had the right to participate in the election receiving and counting votes. In some cases, it entailed the authorization of supporting people who assist those officers inside the polling station. Second, we also produced uh, special electoral materials for persons with disabilities to allow them the exercise of free and secret voting, such as braille language sheets for ballot papers, user manual in braille languages, uh, so people with visual disabilities can vote without someone else's help, as well as special polling booths for wheelchair users and people short, of short stature, among other measures. We issued also another protocol to set priority assistance for persons with disabilities for the issuance of their voting ID which, by the way, the voting ID, the voting card in Mexico is the largest uh, uh, ID uh, 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 for identification, not just for electoral matters, but uh, in general. So the right of, uh, of, uh, be of the identification depends on having this electoral ID. In some cases, uh, it's established, the procedures, so INE, uh, personnel come to the house of people who cannot leave it to register them in the electoral list. Several drills were also include, uh, conduct, uh, conducted during an electoral process for persons with motor, intellectual, hearing or visual disabilities simulating voting uh, exercises that were broadcasted online so people with any disability, polling station officers, political parties, representatives at the polling stations, and electoral observers could be habituated with that special procedures. Finally, a pilot program was successfully deployed, setting polling stations inside hospitals to allow votations of hospitalized persons, as well as their relatives and medical personnel during election day. Let me resume some of the impact data of that measures. Almost 90,000 people with some kind of disability have voted in 2018 elections. Almost 2,000 people with some disability were selected as polling station officers during uh, uh, the last general election. Among them, almost uh, 1,600 people accept to participate and receive training. As you can see in the slide, uh, we had polling station officers with different kinds of disabilities and impairments. Almost 800 people with disabilities effectively participated on election day, uh, playing different roles as, as polling station officers, such as the president of the polling table, secretary and scrutineers. Almost a half of those polling station officers uh, were accompanied by people they trusted or assisted by another polling station member or another official, uh, electoral official. Um, as I said before, oops, well, there is no slide. I just assumed it, I had it, right? As I said before, the successful accessibility measures are part of a general framework of decisions of a policy of inclusion and protection of discriminated groups that INE has deployed during the years, and particularly during last year's election. That policy included 
affirmative actions to grant political women inclusion and actualize uh, uh, gender parity principle, as well as to prevent and punish political uh, uh, gender violence against women. Measures for the inclusion and the political representation of indigenous groups and com original communities, and measures also to prevent discrimination and warranty political inclusion of transgender persons. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Lorenzo. Um, next, we're going to go to Revital from the Access, Access Israel. Um, Flicker? Thank you. Well, do I? This one? Okay. Everything is okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like uh, to start with the background uh, about uh, the two organizations which I represent today. Access Israel strives to make Israel a place where people with various disabilities are integrated into society with dignity, respect, equal rights, and maximum independence. Being both head of Access Israel North, which is the northern extension of this organization, and vice mayor of Kiryat Bialik, I did my best to improve the accessibility of the municipal election taking place in uh, 2018. A few personal sentences about me. <coughs> you cannot see from here, but I'm a wheelchair user. I was born without any disability. One year later, I entered the statistics of the big pandemic uh, polio. And since then, I lost the ability to walk. Nevertheless, I did everything that I planned and wanted. I studied a doctorate in biology, in microbiology. I, had a fam I have a family, I'm a proud grandmother. And uh, after 36 years of uh, research, I uh, did two big changes in my life. The first one was to be elected already three terms uh, as a council member. And uh, in the same time, I was uh, uh, nominated to be head of Access Israel North. Last year, I was uh, nominated to be the vice mayor of my hometown, Kiryat Bialik. I am the first and unfortunately the only one a vice mayor with severe disability in Israel. And I hope this will be changing as soon as possible. The essence, thank you, the essence of the project, uh, advertising the exact location of accessible voting stations in municipal internet sites, local newspapers, and other means. This was the first change that I did when I uh, was nominated. We arranged accessible assemblies of voters with candidates, with various candidates prior to the election. This was not the situation before I was nominated. Third, oh, sorry. Third, by the way, this is not accessible, so I use both apparatuses. Third, uh, I uh, took a uh, into consideration to make accessible parking places near the voting station. This was also not the situation before. Uh, we took the special consideration to guide uh, to voting stations using signs with high contrast for voters with impaired vision. Moreover, we prepared accessible paths without any obstacles from the, this parking area to the voting station. We instructed the staff serving in the voting station to treat the disabled voters and their accompanying persons with respect and sensitivity. 
sensitivity. This was also a big change. The location of the accessible voting stations uh, was picked very carefully. In highly populated neighborhood, preferring location near bus station for those who cannot drive and saving on special trans transportation. We used the double envelope systems so that there will be no need for anybody to vote near his home address. Otherwise, they could go and vote in every uh, voting station which is accessible. We arranged proper service for voters with hearing impairment. The innovative, innovative aspect, we wanted to enable citizens with disabilities, which consist approximately 20% of the population, either in Israel or in my hometown, Kiryat Bialik, to fulfill their civil rights, to vote in the municipal election, thus being an active part of the society. The impact created thus created was to enable disabled citizens to take active part, to be seen, to be felt in the society, in the democratic process, thus creating a significant change in the society. Ah, sorry. Mm. The next steps for, this time doesn't count. <laughs> the, the next steps for the project, enabling blind people to use accessible ballots, promoting digital voting, especially for citizens in hospitals and remote peripheral and rural areas of Israel. And hopefully all ballots will be accessible eventually. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Revital. Our final speaker, Antonio. So, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank Zero Project for the invitation to be a speaker at this delightful conference. And as, as it is usual in this conference, in this presentation, I'm going to share good news because I'm going to talk about the battle we have fought in Spain to gain the right to vote for all persons with disabilities, and I am proud to say that we have won this battle. Thank you very much. Nevertheless, I will also talk about the challenges we are still facing, and I think this experience might be useful for other countries because there are still 16 countries of the European Union where persons, some persons with disabilities are deprived of their right to vote, and I think we could draw some general conclusions. So we all know the framework, and the framework is uh, Article 29 of the Convention uh, of, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which recognizes the right and opportunity for, for persons with disabilities to vote and be elected. And to this general framework, we have to add Article 23 of the Spanish Constitution, which recognizes to all citizens with any, without any explicit restriction the right to participate in public affairs directly or through their representatives freely elected. Despite these provisions, the Spanish electoral law allowed the court to deprive a person declared legally incompetent of her right to vote and to be elected. And in fact, and in fact, more than 100,000 persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities had been deprived of these rights. After the convention came into force, the courts should have decided to apply directly Article 29 of the convention and not to apply the provision of our electoral law because in Spain, international treaties have direct application and uh, even take precedence over our uh, na national laws. But this had not been, has not been the case, and while some courts were 
quite progressive and has restored the right to vote to persons with intellectual disabilities, provided they had some minimal knowledge of what they wanted to do. Other courts required to prove that the person was not going to be influenced and, thus, and that he or she had a certain level of political knowledge. Let me tell you briefly the, the story of Angela. Angela. She is a girl with Down syndrome of my city, placed under guardianship of her parents, and she wanted to vote, and her parents demanded the court to restore her right to vote, and the judge interviewed her, and one, one of the questions was, what is democracy for you? And she didn't know what to answer, as would have happened to many citizens. But because she didn't know what to answer, the judge decided that she was not able to vote due to the lack of sufficient political knowledge. So we have to fight, to fight a very intense battle, especially in the last three years. And there have been three main battlefields, so to say. And I think it's very important to join in the defense of the right of persons with disabilities. It is very important to join the three strategies I am going to talk about. First one is the academical battlefield. That's where I belong. With articles and studies providing that the deprival of the right to vote was not compliant with the convention and not even compliant with the Spanish constitution. One can think that this is a less influential strategy, but I think it is very important to implement it, not because I, am, I belong to the academic field, but I think that these academical studies, these scientific studies, provide arguments and make more solid and rigorous the other two strategies. The second strategy is the judicial one, and it started with the case of Mara. Mara is a girl with Down syndrome who lives in Galicia in the northeast of Spain, who was subject to guardianship of her, of her parents, but she wanted to vote, and her parents too, so dem she demanded the right to vote, like Angela. But the difference with Angela is that when she was denied the right to vote by the first instance, then she appealed. And she was also denied the right, the right to vote by the second instance, and then by the Spanish Supreme Court, and then we introduced a complaint before the Spanish Constitutional Court, arguing that the deprivation of right to vote was not compatible with the Spanish Constitution, but it was also dismissed. And then we have also filed a claim for the European Court of Human Rights, and we are waiting for the sentence. But at the same time, a political strategy was implemented, taking advantage of the attention that was given to the, by the media to the case of Mara, the Spanish platform which includes almost all representative organizations of persons with disabilities, CERMI, in collaboration with Plena Inclusion, here are some representatives of Plena Inclusion, launched a campaign called My Vote Counts, and a very important landmark moment of this campaign was a demonstration in front of the Spanish Constitutional Court after the dismissal of Mara's complaint on February 8, 2017. At the same time, a dialogue with the political parties started, and finally, the Socialist Party introduced a bill in the Parliament, and last November, it has been unanimously approved. So we have arrived to the Act of December 5, 2018, which is, in my opinion, a historical milestone, because uh, it finishes with one of the most important discriminations that persons with disabilities faced in Spain, because depriving the right to vote means, in fact, denying the condition of citizen, as citizenship implies mainly participating in collective decisions. So the new Spanish law abolishes the provision that allowed the persons with disability, uh, uh, that allowed to deprive persons with disabilities the right to vote, restores automatically the right to vote to all persons of dis with disabilities that had been deprived of it by judicial uh, judgment by, uh, and recognizes explicitly that all persons have the right to vote. And also a very important provision is that uh, it recognizes that any person can exercise the right to vote with the support he or she needs. This last provision is very important, our world for persons with intellectual disabilities that might need assistance in the process of voting. For example, to choose the ballot of, or the, of the party or candidate they wish to vote. Article 29 of the CRPD explicitly requires the states to allow this assistance in voting, and the new Spanish law recognizes the right to receive this assistance.
In spite of this historical milestone, we still face some important challenges to make our elections fully accessible. And I will point out very briefly four challenges which are common to the other countries. The first one is to ensure the accessibility, the physical accessibility of polling stations. In our country, although the law requires the polling stations to be accessible, there are still many polling stations that do not comply with this requirement. According to the last report published by the Spanish government on this issue, which is very old, which is of, from 2012, in the general elections of 2018, there were uh, more than one, uh, more than 1,600 police stations which were not accessible, which represented a 7%. But the real number is much higher, because this report was based on information provided by the city councils, and the city council do not always follow an appropriate assessment of, of accessibility. And we have to remark that the lack of accessibility hinders persons with disabilities being able to exercise their right to vote on an equal basis with others. The second challenge is accessibility of, this, of communication. We should reform our electoral law at least to ensure that during the electoral campaign all the advertisement with general electoral information and all the electoral spot made by the different political parties have subtitling and sign language interpretation. The third one is accessible vote for persons with visual impairments. We have in Spain an accessible vote procedure for persons with visual impairments since 2007 in Spain, which was awarded as innovative policy as the Zero Project Conference 2015. But this procedure only works for European general elections and in some regions also for regional elections, but not for local elections. And the last challenge we have talked about that in another panel this morning, is cognitive accessibility. This is my opinion subject in many fields, but we, had, we should ensure that information on electoral procedures and also information of the political parties on their programs is published in easy to read format. And I know that my time is over, but uh, because I am the last one, I will be one minute more, because I want to uh, talk about the last question, which is, we have to promote political participation of, of persons with disabilities. This is also a challenge. In the case of the Spanish Parliament, for example, only two members of the lower chamber, from a total of the lower chamber, from a total of 350, and two members of the upper chamber, from a total of 263, are persons with disabilities. That means that only 0.65% of the parliamentarians are persons with disabilities which means that the very important sector of the population, which amounts approximately to 10%, is clearly underrepresented. And I think that what happens in the Spanish Parliament can be easily uh, extrapolated to all other countries. So I think we should adopt legal measures to uh, correct the situation. It is not easy to design such measures, but, and they depend, of course, from the different electoral systems of the, of the countries. But I suggest to discuss, and I leave, this on the, I leave that as a matter of discussion or debate on the table, uh, I suggest to discuss on the possibility of either requiring political parties to include persons with disabilities in their list of candidates to representative institutions, or at least another possibility is to provide financial incentives to political parties which include persons with disabilities among their candidates. In this field of political participation, like in all other matters concerning uh, social inclusion of persons with disabilities, we can draw a conclusion. We have improved a lot. We have improved in Spain with this new law that recognizes the right to vote to persons with disabilities, but we have still a long way ahead. I am sure that Zero Project will continue making possible for us to advance and to advance much faster. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Antonio. It is really striking the um, passion and the, that each of our speakers have brought to the goal of making elections accessible to people with disabilities and the, and the thoughtfulness and the perseverance and the, the fact that they really had, had to invest in doing this work over an extensive period of time, the, the magnitude of the challenge when you consider the number of polling sites um, and um, the recognition that there still is more, still is more to do. And we actually do have quite a bit of time for questions.
So let me open it up for questions. If you could just raise your hand, we can call on you. You could direct your question to any of the panelists or to all of the panelists. Yes, and if you use your microphone. Thank you. Yeah, I'm from Sweden. And in Sweden, people with visual impairment, they have said, we want to vote digitally. But the authority, they have looked at the, that point and say, no, we are afraid that people, um, we are afraid that it won't be reliable. So in Sweden, we can only vote manually. But in some of your countries, you can vote digitally. Can you tell me a little bit about how the discussion has been in your countries? So who, do you want to start there? Well, go. OK. I invite you to our booth to, to meet the representative of Orcam company. They developed uh, some apparatus which enables to vote without uh, any accompanying person. That also, sure, I can I can do that. Uh, in the context of elections, we're we're often trying to balance between accessibility to the polls with integrity of the polls. And, and that's the balance that an election administrator has to strike on an ongoing basis. And so that, that comes to the heart of electronic voting. Uh, I, more more uh, exact, online voting. And uh, in the context in which I have worked, uh, there is not a level of comfort with online voting. Uh, in the current context, and therefore you don't see larger election management bodies uh, 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 taking on online voting at this point, certainly not in the Canadian context. Um, we have a plan over three electoral cycles to introduce potentially, if the technology proves itself, uh, online voting for specific groups that don't have access. And I would see that uh, uh, disabled voters would be uh, within that category. But I can't tell you what our legislators will ultimately say. Uh, I will make arguments one way or another. Um, but ultimately, it's not about offering, I, I don't know that online is the only solution. There are a variety of solutions, and in, in the context, context of my jurisdiction, that's what we're pursuing. More diverse, uh, a diversity of options for uh, disabled voters so that they can uh, vote on their own. Anyone? Uh, in Mexico, we have uh, established by law uh, manual votation, a uh, manual votation system. Uh, the reason is, uh, is very particular. The whole Mexican electoral system is based on distrust. So, even if we have a manual voting system in the former elections, there was, there were, there was an accusation of an electronic fraud. So, this is Mexico. Uh, the point is, we have a very, I mean, uh, 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 Brazil is a country with the, with the, with the, with the, with the, I mean, with the people who distrust on authorities as well as Mexico. And despite that, Brazil has electronic votation uh, since 2012, right? Or more than 20 years, anyway. And they have a very, I, I won't, uh, uh, it took uh, Fernando's place, but uh, I mean, he has to talk about Brazilian elections. But what I mean, uh, what I want to say is that Mexico has a, a very complex context with migration. We have a, a, a huge dia diaspora, uh, more than 13 million uh, of city, me Mexican citizens, I'm not talking people, citizens, we assume live abroad, particularly in the United States, and we have a, a, a votation from abroad. Until now, it is a votation, a, a manual, a postal votation. Uh, and we are uh, uh, finally we have the, 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 right, the, the, the power to introduce electronic votation system just for abroad, but which is not bad because I mean it's a very I mean it's one step to, to the uh, way to introduce electronic votation in Mexico, and we are thinking on uh, uh, votation on internet. I mean it's very complicated for with that di diaspora so huge as. A, as we have to think in another electronic votation system. The problem is the law, because of the distrust, uh, 
establish several uh, uh, steps we have to, to achieve. For instance, we have to develop uh, the electronic system uh, and we have to submit it to the uh, uh, auditing of two major uh, uh, international enterprises uh, to validate, you know, not just the system but the, but the, but the procedures. The problem is that internationally there are just a very, a, a very few uh, companies that uh, uh, that can de do this uh, uh, auditing, which are by, which are by the way the providers. So we have a problem in that. But I think Mexico's case is one uh, uh, one case, case to be studied in the next years uh, uh, because we are I mean we are improving and we are trying to introduce electronic votation. <coughs> And, and, and in a first step, uh, as I said, uh, for the abroad votation. Uh, just to make sure that we in Brazil, we have for over 20 years the electronic uh, voting system. And it's mandatory. We don't have the analog voting uh, manually. We don't have manual votes. Every vote in Brazil is in the polling machine. And, but we don't, they, these polling machines are not connected to the internet because of the distrust we have from people also. So we're, in the last elections, 2018, we had a huge uh, public problem uh, with distrust with some kind of, uh, uh, some people saying that it was fraud you know, and, and everything. So, but it's, I, uh, I can assure you that over 20 years, this system is working and it's working perfectly. We have, in the 2014 elections, the past elections, we had a huge problem with that. Some parties tried to audit or, or uh, make a lawsuit about it. I don't know how you call it. Uh, everything was really functioning and working properly. So, uh, but the thing is, it's electronic, but you have to go to the polling stations, and it's only one day. So the first Sunday of October, you go to the polling station from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and every people in Brazil, everybody, have to go on that Sunday to vote. So we cannot vote from home, you cannot vote online, you cannot uh, settle a specific day to vote. You have to go on that day. So I, I don't know if it's uh, something that you asked about, but... Yeah, so uh, IFAS doesn't work in the U.S., but I've been a poll worker multiple times in the U.S., um, and majority of states actually used to have touchscreen voting machines that you could come in that had a socket that you could either plug in your own headphones or use the ones that were provided. Um, unfortunately, there's actually been a trend because of similar distrust <laughs> issues um, to going back to having paper ballots now. So the state of Virginia, where I'm from, we used to have these touchscreens which voters seem to really enjoy and use. They were accessible, um, and now we've gone back the last few elections to using paper ballots. Um, so the trend, at least in the U.S., is right now going backwards um, on that. But in a majority of the countries where IFAS works, we're hearing the same thing from voters with visual disabilities in particular, that voting online would be of, of interest and beneficial. Um, but the countries where we're working, there's just not enough trust and the technology isn't there yet to do that. Um, so the majority of the places where we work, we're developing tactile ballot guides um, with the disability community and with election commissions for voters to, to use that to vote in person with the paper. Other questions? Why don't we go in the, in the back? That, you, that would be you, yes. Thank you. Uh, it's another Swedish question. I'm sorry about that. Uh, um, in Sweden, we have some statistics about uh, the, uh, uh, the level of, of um, uh, uh, voting, the percentage of voting, depending on different disabilities, and it proves that in Sweden, people with intellectual disability have the lowest of the low amount of people that go voting. And yet, most of the discussions uh, in Sweden, as I believe in other countries, starts with the technical solutions and the solutions that you can measure and, you know, it's, it's physical, it's, it's measuring. Um, and I was wondering what's the situation for voters with intellectual disabilities in some of your countries? Uh, uh, are, they, are, they, are there measures to include them? <laughs> Uh, 
what we do, we uh, give a simplified version of the rules and we uh, send them to those organizations with, uh, of uh, people with uh, uh, disabilities. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> please. I cannot see the speaker, please. Uh, we, we call it a, a simplification of the law and uh, we send it in advance prior to the elections and thus we encourage those people, uh, those disabled people uh, to vote and uh, statistically we notice that it helps. It weighs the percent of the voters that you mentioned. Um, so over the past couple of years, uh, IFAS has worked in saying about 60 to 70 different countries on election, election access issues. Um, and in a majority of those countries, the barrier happens way before even getting to the polling station. It's the law. Um, so a majority of countries actually have ratified the CRPD, which, as you all know, taken Article 29, Article 12 together, um, people who are under guardianship, which often people with intellectual or psychosocial disabilities are, should be allowed to vote since the country has ratified the CRPD, but most countries have not aligned their national laws with that. Um, so a lot of our work is actually around the election law reform and trying to get those laws changed so that then we can even work towards addressing increased voter turnout among people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. Um, and even in the U.S., for example, in 38 out of 50 states in the U.S., if you're under guardianship, you can't vote. So this legal barrier is, is the main barrier in many country contexts, I think, before, you know, I know Sweden, Canada doesn't have that legal barrier, so then it is more of a get-out-the-vote initiative. But in a majority of the countries, we're finding it's the legal barrier is the biggest problem. Um, I just follow up on Virginia's comments. Um, in, in, in many jurisdictions, the focus is actually not on the get out the vote uh, component for the election management body. The focus is on the barrier itself. And in my jurisdiction, it is much more on determining what the barrier is to those voters. Whether or not they show up at the polls is up to them. It's not required that they vote any citizen to vote, uh, it's not, and, and that's not what my role is as the chief electoral officer. So um, we have not collected data in that context, but what we are beginning to do is, co is collect data with regard to the barrier itself. So um, ultimately, I was interested in Virginia's uh, discussion before on whether or not a polling location was actually uh, accessible. In our context, it was over 98%, I believe it was 99% accessible uh, among all of our polling locations. But we actually had a problem with that. It, it wasn't 99% when we sent out our teams to actually determine whether we had an accessible polling location. What we found upon checking was that it was much lower than that and we had to force our teams to go out again and be more strict with them so that we could get that level up. So it is an ongoing concern, but it's about the barrier itself, the many different barriers that are there because we don't want any of our voters to have a barrier of access to the ballot itself. No, what, go ahead. Uh, in Brazil, our constitution demands everybody to vote. It's mandatory. It doesn't matter if you are a person with a disability or not. What you can do is, if you have any kind of disability, you have uh, uh, 151 days to tell the judiciary that you have that disability so we can provide the need you, uh, you have or the need that, that you might uh, actually uh, see as a barrier so that we can take it out and you can go on October to vote every two years. The thing is, I have the numbers here, and if you are a person with a disability and you find it very hard to go to, uh, to, go to vote at the polling station, you have to communicate the judge and the judge will decide, will see the actual situation, your needs, your disability, and we will decide if you have or you don't have to vote. And in numbers, I said in 2018, we had 940,000 people with disabilities that were able to vote. 
but only 380,000 people went actually to vote. From 2016, there was over 600,000 people with disabilities that had the right to vote, but only 131,000 people actually voted, showed up on, on polling station. And if you don't go to the judge before the, the election day, and you are authorized not to vote, you don't show up and you get a fine. The thing is, the fine is so low, so low that in the, the actual days, they don't do anything. You just go and pay the fine, because it's easier than to go to the judge and ask not to vote, and ask the permission not to go to the polling station, so. Very shortly, uh, in Mexico, uh, uh, there is no condition of, uh, except the nationality and the age uh, to have the right to vote, to become a citizen to have the right to vote. Uh, therefore, is no uh, legal impediment for anyone uh, with disability to vote, even if it is a, a, an intellectual disability. Uh, electoral law established anyway that any people with any kind of disability uh, or uh, uh, people who cannot read or, and, and write can be assisted by a people of their trust, uh, trust in the, uh, during votation procedures. So many people with this, uh, intellectual disabilities come with their uh, relatives and, 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 and uh, be helped to vote. Um, in Mexico, it happens m uh, with more dramatic uh, 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 data, more or less what happens in Brazil, and just Fernando said, uh, uh, the, the, the general census established more or less 12% uh, of the uh, Mexican people has uh, some kind of disability. Uh, those are the official data. I'm not saying that those are right, exactly I mean, correct. Uh, but anyway, if that's true, more or less 9 million uh, of uh, uh, potential voters has, has, has some kind of disability. We have a 90 million electoral, li electoral list. And uh, in the last election, uh, only uh, 90,000 uh, citizens with some kind of disability voted. So that's also a, 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 a fact, no, a, a real data on the, uh, 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 that uh, shows that there is a long way to go still in an inclusive election. I would just offer two, two additional observations on, uh, in response to this question. Um, one is we don't have data. We don't have good data about the voting participation of people with intellectual um, di disabilities, at least not, not in the U U.S., and it would be great to come up with um, you know, strateg strategies for get getting that data. The, another <coughs> observation, though, just anecdotally, is, is that um, in my experience, I think that participation in self-advocacy organizations or disabled people organizations, uh, that folks who participate are much more likely, in my experience, to be, to be in, involved in um, participating uh, both in policy advocacy and in the political process. And so I think there's a very important role for self-advocacy organizations uh, to play in this area. I think we had another question. We had some other hands up. Other questions? You okay. <laughs> um, okay. Gentleman in the white shirt. Do we have a microphone? We can get you. Microphone is coming to you. Hello. Uh, congratulations for your effort for accessible elections, firstly. And I am wondering that how can you determine the uh, disabled voters in your country? Because uh, sometimes it may be difficult to determine that. Or if I am blind, for example, uh, should I apply for accessibility or the accessible solution automatically comes to me? How, what kind of system are working in that position? 
Well, in the case of Mexico, every polling station uh, should be provided with uh, accessibility measures and uh, materials, such as braille uh, forms to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to allow the votation for uh, uh, visual uh, uh, disabilities people and so on. Uh, so it's a long effort because it's not, uh, it not depends on the census on which polling station should probably be uh, a, a disability voter. Uh, uh, every one of the more than 156,000 polling stations should be provided on the, on the disability mechanisms. No? I think, I think your question raises a very important conceptual issue, and it is that uh, also accessibility, uh, the, the requirement that we must satisfy is designed for all persons. That means uh, the accessibility is not, uh, that doesn't come afterwards because someone demands accessibility, so accessibility must be provided uh, for all, no? uh, universal accessibility, and that means in the field we are considering, that, field, that means that polling station must be accessible, that means that uh, electoral information and information of the political parties must be accessible, subtitling, uh, interpretation in sign language, cognitive, so easy to read format, etc., etc. So all in general, the accessibility must be assured, uh, so to say, ex ante, so previously to the elections. No? There are some cases in which this is not possible, and then come the second step, which is reasonable adjustment. For example, in Spain, if you are blind and you want to vote if you are blind, you, you can go to vote, and, and we, we have to assure, ensure that the uh, polling stations are accessible for persons with visual impairments, etc., etc. The only thing is that if you want to vote in Braille, then you, uh, in this case, you have to ask for the uh, ballot in Braille uh, uh, before. No? And in that case, you will be provided on the election day uh, of, uh, with a ballot in Braille language. Only in that case you have to uh, ask for it because, uh, well, well, what is the reason? It, it, it can be discussed, but the reason is that we, it, it could be very expensive to print all uh, ballots in Braille for every potential voter. So in this case, if you want to vote in Braille, you have to demand it uh, before the election. Uh, in the case of Brazil, it's self-declaration. In the example of bl the blind people, all our polling machines have Braille code, so you don't have to, to ask for anything. You just go and vote because they are all with the Braille code. And if you have any other kind of disability that you might have trouble or a hard time going to the elections on the election day, you have the, the, the 151 days prior to this day to communicate the judiciary and we'll, we'll arrange everything that the person needs to, to vote on, on the election day. Do we have any other questions? We do have time for another question or two, if there are any. No? Well, let's thank all of our panelists, if we could. And thank you all for attending the session this afternoon.